Fish Out of Water, The Sidmouth Life of Stephen Sidney Reynolds, written by Pippa Marriott and David Lloyd. <sighs> Just lie still. Don't try and talk. Harry. Shh. Shh. Let me wet your lips. Don't let them push you aside. No one's being pushed aside. Don't let him, Harry. I know what he's like. I'm right here. Shh, now. Mother wind southerly, Mother? Southerly, shh, 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 shh. Southerly. Calm now. Mother wind south o' oh, the bonny blue sea. Stephen? Bob? Mom? His lungs rattled like pebbles tossed by the storm, and then the tide goes out, and all there is, stillness, silence. I lift his fishing smock from behind the scullery door, breathe in, traces of smoke from other men's pipes, and deep within the weave, essence of salt. Fine gentleman, that Hilaire. Shh, Bob. Stephen Reynolds was, I know, a friend to many, and he was also a friend to me. The sea and Reynolds' skills as a sailor brought us together long before I knew his skills as a writer. Stephen Reynolds was a gentleman who loved the poor, a city boy who understood the sea, a landlubber with salt in his veins, a writer and a fisherman, a man who had charity, humility, and justice in equal poise. He was a brother to sailing men everywhere, but especially here in his beloved Southwest and right here in Sidmouth, the town that welcomed him home. It's good to see so many of the Woolley family in church this morning. I wish that I could come across him again in this world somewhere at the meeting of sea and land, to learn more about the schools of fishes, the labours of those who seek them along our shores, and the souls of sailor men. Are you ready, ma'am? Let's do this together. To, to Steve, Steve in, in loving, in loving memory. memory. Sydney, we called him Sydney. Sidney Reynolds, in affectionate memory. To you, O Lord, we commend the soul of Stephen Sidney Reynolds, your servant. In the sight of this world he is now dead. In your sight may he live forever. Forgive whatever sins he committed through human weakness. And in your goodness grant him everlasting peace. We're so sorry for your loss, Mr. Reynolds. You're by you, uh, he was one of the best. Isn't that right, ma'am? Stevie surely was. I'm an expert on loss, Mr. Woolley. I lost my wife when Sydney was ten, and my son's nerves never recovered. All that nonsense about the arts, music, that awful novel. And then I lost my son a second time to the likes of you, Mr. Woolley. You and that jumped up fisherman, Harry Painter. My son should have stayed at home and married, focused on his career, not pretending poverty down here in godforsaken Sidmouth. Uh, 
excuse, excuse me, sir. Uh, um, uh, sir, can I can I be of any assistance? Oh, what is it, man? Uh, well, begging begging pardon, sir, but a gentleman like you sleeping rough out here. I mean, it, it does it don't seem right. And you was here last night, and and the one before. <sighs> well. I have to say, it's a surprisingly comfortable little shelter. And goodness, is there any better voice than that of the sea to lull you to sleep? Reynolds. I'm Stephen Reynolds. A pleasure to meet you. And you are? Bob. Bob Woolley, sir. And it's a pleasure to meet your acquaintance, sir. Steve. <laughs> Big pardon, Stephen. Steve, please. Let's set off for Steve. <laughs> well, sir, Steve. How's about you come back with me? We're only round the corner of Bedford Square. Uh, just fisher folk we are, but, you know, we keep a clean house and more's always welcome. And as a fisherman, I knows only too well that fortune is a fickle friend. Fickle indeed. I stand here before you as a gentleman, and yet without a single penny to my name. I do, however, have this. You hate me? <laughs> well, that, that'll do nicely, sir. Uh, sorry, Steve. Uh, we'll take that as a down payment. So that was how I met Bob Woolley and the rest of his marvellous family. His brother Tom, his wife Mary, who everyone called Ma'am, and their surviving children. Six live in and four at the cemetery and another two lost. And, and Janie, my, my first wife, uh, for this son, her, her lost had three boys when they were two year and ten months. One year and seven months, and, and one, one at nine months. And poor Janie died, died herself when, when Mabel were under a year. In all my 22 years, I had never met such open, welcoming and honest folk. Folk who discussed the things that really mattered. I can't tell you how refreshing that was after the dusty trivialities of devisers and the chatter I'd heard on my travels in the southwest. I had been irritated beyond amusement by those ghastly people who flood into Devon on their holidays. From their talk, most of them were never on anything else, whereas Ma'am would have genuine concerns. We'll have some bread and scrape enough to get us through this long winter. And Bob, fisherman through and through, would worry if all that hauling of his boat up Sidmouth Beach... I'd be not taking too much out of me. Am I not ageing before my time? What with my rheumatics and all... Lord, but will I be a pastor and for the youngest these little ones is off our hands? <laughs> You're still young in my eyes, Bob, and strong enough to wrestle with me <laughs> of an evening. Whatever life put in their paths, the Woolies would stoically assert, What, what will, will be, be will, will be. be. Us, Us can't, can't but do, do our, our best. best. Tis, Tis the, the way, way of it. it. And so it was. We all did our bit. And what would be, would be. As for that halfpenny I gave to Bob all those years ago... It sat on the mantelpiece at the Woolies long after I was gone, and, if I understand correctly, it sits in my old house to this very day. They've turned it into a museum, you know. Still, I'm getting ahead of myself. Where were we? It's 1903, Sidmouth. I'm living with the Woolies and making my life amongst the fishermen. I learnt more in their company than in any university or London club, but I wasn't simply learning to read the tides and steer the drifters. I was learning how to live. We'll be all right if the wind was in our sails. We'll be all right if the wind is in our sails. And we'll all hang on behind. And we'll roll the old chariot along. We'll roll the old chariot along. We'll roll the old chariot along. And we'll all hang on behind. Well, a night on the town wouldn't do us any harm. A night on the town wouldn't do us any harm. A night on the town wouldn't do us any harm. And we'll all hang on in the offing. And we'll roll the old to the big rolling sea. But my eyes could not see it. The bark that is bearing my lover to me. 
Oh, mother, let me move on. Please, don't take me back there. Why won't my hands stop shaking? My father went to see, 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 to see what he could see, see, see. But all that he could see, 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 was the bottom of the deep blue sea, see, see. Come and play, Steve. Do the clapping, Mr Reynolds. Mr Reynolds. Oi, push off all of you. But he's sleeping with his eyes open again, ma'am. <laughs> Bob, here a minute. He's having another turn. Steve. Stephen, it's gone on too long this time. You're going to have to write to Devizes, let his father know. It was my aunt, not my father, who came for me. That's it, Sydney. Come along. Mother? It's Ada. Aunt Ada. I'm taking you home, Stephen Sydney Reynolds. Back to Devizes. Back to where you belong. Come along. Wilkins has your bag. Good God, Sydney, what were you thinking? A gentleman, like you, living like this. Excuse me, ma'am. No, thank you, Mrs Willie. We won't be needing your sandwiches. My invalid son brought home wrapped in a blanket and shaking all over, just like a stray dog. Hardly the bright future he'd hoped for. There were days I was almost glad his mother wasn't alive to see him so stricken. My sister Ada nursed him. I had him seen by a London physician. Neurasthenia, the doctor called it. A great deal of money was spent to discover that entirely unhelpful diagnosis. The cure? Rest, I ask you. After a while, his shakes steadied a little, and the light came back in his eyes. He seemed almost normal. He started his scribblings again, and the daft notions came back. He showed no interest whatsoever in Devizes society, certainly not in the young women. And he went out and bought himself a dog. Not just any dog. A Great Dane bitch. Absurd. He could barely take care of himself. I called my magnificent hound Margot. And though my father would not, or could not, understand me, Margot did. As soon as I was strong enough, we set off, Margot and I, heading west, walking to the one place that felt more like home than home ever had. Well, not since Mother... Margot? Yeah, Margot? Good girl. Look, see over there? Say hello to Sidmouth, old girl. We're going home. Mine is hot, ma'am, but not burning. God, let's get those boots off. My word, Steve, you likes a challenge. That's, that's more than 100 miles from devices. Lord have mercy. It's like the hound of the Blessed Baskerville. Ah, she's a she-berry. I can keep her in the yard. Rosie can give her some fish heads. We didn't think we'd be seeing you again, Steve. Thought we'd lost you to the comforts of your gentleman's life. I heard the sea calling me back, Bob. The call of the herons. And Mam's tea, of course. Now get your feet in that pail, Stevie. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, it's good to be back. All that time shut away pretending I was a writer, writing a novel of no interest to any publisher, let alone a reader. I'm done with all of that, Bob. Time to put these hands of mine to useful work. Oh, well, you've been getting soft. Some early mornings longshore will sort you out. That and, and ma'am's cooking. Well, come on then. Any news for us? What have us missed? Any romance in the air? 
good-looking fella like you. Oh, I've got Margot, ma'am. I don't need anybody else. Did Bob tell you our news? Another one on the way. Bob, you old dog. I'll drink to that. Welcome home, Stevie. Good to have you back. My Crawforte was snug up in the kitchen. The Willie's kitchen was a shrine to the teapot and the beating heart of the house. I can picture it now. The small paned window, the courting chair beside it, tucked under the shelves and laden with fancy china and fishing tackle. The kitchener opened up into a comforting fireplace and a well-placed storage cupboard situated perfectly so that the cockroaches, with ample food and warmth, could grow fat and multiply alarmingly. There was a high dresser, crammed with china in every colour and pattern, that stood beside the door to the narrow passageway, out to the backyard and the linny. The passage ceiling was slung with sails and spars, so that you had to stoop to pass through. Every inch of available wall in that kitchen was decorated with old almanacs, tide tables, Bob's fishing certificate, and a vast number of small pictures, all nautical, all more or less askew. All more or less like home. You stay in, Steve. Ain't you? You tell us you are. Well, I thought I'd take Margot to Dartmoor. Still, if you'll have us both. Yes, I'm staying. For good this time. What do we do with the herring eyes? We make them into puddings and pies. Herring eyes, puddings and pies, and all sorts of things. The herring is the king of the sea. The herring is the fish for me. The herring is the king of the sea. Sing for the middle of day. The beach was more than a place of trade to the Sidmouth fishermen. It was the narrow channel through which the tides of a longshoreman's life flowed, from the sea where he worked to the land where he lived, and back again. I would look out to sea the way a mother gazes at her child, noting every movement, every shadow on the waters, learning to read the waves, and always wondering what the future had in store, what the next tide might bring in. Herrings are up! Sixteen shillings a thousand afore Christmas! Them fetching two pounds a thousand in Plymouth and buys they waiting for them all over the kingdom! Oh, there's great bodies of them at our seas like it hadn't come for years! Hauls of ten thousand or so on Christmas night! About three in the afternoon, when the drifters put out to sea, the nor'west wind was springing out in squalls. It blew the white tops off the wavelets, and the sou'westerly swell starting to heave in its way in. That's when it occurred to me. Here was all the material a writer could ever need. I would capture these voices, these lives, write it all down. It's blowing fresh not so far out, and it's blowing half a gale from the sou'west and the channel. You see that black line across the horizon there? Well, that's the southwest wind, and there's plenty of it. The same boats aren't fitted for this. Ain't no fit craft for herring drifting. The mainmast of the seine boat was toppled over to port. No sooner was it restepped, sail hoisted, then over it went again. Step of the mast! Oh it's gone! They're gonna capsize! Oh. They'd be better off rowing! Oh. Lord, what they be thinking? Well, when a man has a chance to catch herring and pay his way, pay a debt or two maybe, it is only right to try. I wrote it all down, then changed it, just a little. Names and such, to protect my friends. What I was writing was neither autobiography nor fiction, nor was it simply my journal. I called it autobiographiction. If I could set down what these lives were like, how these people spoke, then I could give a true voice to the experiences of the poor. I wanted to counteract the assumptions of so-called sociologists, those meddlers who look for evil amongst the poor. I tried, so far as was possible for a man of middle-class breeding and education, to live their lives, share their interests, and make them my own. I found amongst the Woolies and their fellows some of my closest, wisest and most entertaining friends, 
I hadn't chosen this life with a particular purpose. I simply found in Sidmouth more of a home and more beauty of life and happiness than I had met with anywhere else. I called my writings A Poor Man's House, and to my great surprise, whilst my earlier novel, The Holy Mountain, still languished in my desk, A Poor Man's House was not only published in 1908, but also received some rather good reviews, from the likes of John Galsworthy, John Buchan, and my friend the poet, Edward Thomas. Joseph Conrad described it as Compact, harmonious, without a single, I won't say false, but uncertain tone. True in aim, sentiment and expression, precise and imaginative. Never precious, but containing here and there an absolutely priceless phrase. Still, there were some critics. Beautifully bound, Bob. And some of it I remember saying. A a poor man's house. (laughs) I never knew he was poor. And my knowledge of the fishing community stood me in good stead for my work with the government, overseeing the fishing industry in the South West. Fisheries office? Mr Morris? Henry? Reynolds here? Oh yes, busy. Two projects on the go at the moment. Remember my engine idea, fixing a motor to a fishing boat? Well, the prototypes work wonderfully. Puffin, we called her. Yes, Puffin. Her maiden voyage was a fantastic success. Five hours, Dartmouth to Sidmouth, in dreadful fog. Yes, I'm delighted. Now we can tow the drifters out. And exactly. Henry's sorry, but London doesn't agree with me or Margot. But I'm nearly there with this report, however. It's absolutely imperative that there's recognition of fisheries to put them on an equal footing with agriculture. The top priority has to be this insurance issue. Promise me you'll get it through Parliament so that these men can finally insure their vessels, for God's sake. Excellent. That's wonderful. The other project? Oh, it's some land on Cliff Road, building a house. Yes, I'm hoping very much that my dear friends the Woolies will join me there. The thicket, you say? Well, it is certainly a very grand house, Stevie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is, it's, it's quite a bit further from the shore. But fine views of the sea, though. I can't see the children feeling at home. It's so... Oh, no, that's true enough, too, no, I, I, I don't think so. You won't be surprised to learn that the Woolies never moved in. And in the end, neither did I. And neither, might I add, did Harry. Ah, uh, Harry. Harry Painter, what would I have done without you? Excuse me? Harry. Yes, Harry. I see you know you're fishing. I was wondering, might I make a proposition? Proposition, sir? Oh, please, call me Stephen. Might you like to try your hand at being a clerk? It's an office job, I know, but it's all work related to fishing without those early mornings. I can't tell you how much I need someone like you. It's decent, steady pay, Harry, for a young man like yourself, and you'd be supporting the fisheries and me. (laughs) I'll think about it. You could always... Live in, rent free. Harry is the king of the sea. Harry is the one to believe. Oh, Harry is the king of the sea. Sing, oh, come to the Lord of the <laughs> Germany invades Belgium. Great Britain at war. Foreign Office announcement at 12.15. England expects that every man will do his duty. As Big Ben strikes 11pm, we are at war. The Navy were desperate to enlist anyone with sailing experience. Nearly a third of recruits were 14 to 18 year olds 
young lads signing up for an adventure, thinking they'd be home by Christmas. They're just boys. Who's, who's going to be left to catch their fish? Tis the only blessed food not on the ration list. Our men should be protected. When conscription was introduced, there was a deep sense of injustice in the fishing communities. Many boats lost their entire crews to the war. I negotiated a compromise with the war office, convincing them that the first priority for these experienced fishermen was to catch fish and provide non-rationed protein to feed the nation. Their second was the Navy. Section Y was formed as part of the Naval Reserve. If push came to shove, these men would be called up at a moment's notice, but until then they were free to carry on fishing. I drew up national distribution plans for the fish. I even promoted fish recipes for those housewives less used to cooking the bounty of the sea. Back out to sea, lads. We've got work to do. Them herry won't catch themselves. Oh, the herring is the king of the sea. The herring is the fish for me. The herring is the king of the sea. Sing for the old little old day. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While there's a Lucifer to light your fag, smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile. A pitiful thing, war, and what it does to men. How many times I heard the cry of, it's not fair. And of course, it wasn't fair, but that was the point. War is the overriding of fairness by force. There is no fairness in a bullet finding one man and not another, in one ship being sunk and not another, one woman's son dying wretchedly and another's coming home a hero. It wasn't fair, none of it. It was simply sad. Cruel and sad and pitiable. 117 men of Sidmouth never came back from that war. Thank God Harry and I had protected occupations, protected from going to war at least. Southerly, 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 blow the wind south o'er oh, the bonny blue sea. We should join the parade later, Steve. The whole town is giddy with it. Never seen so many flags. Raise a glass with me. Steve. Stephen, where is it you go? Come on, a toast. To peace. And to friendship. To friendship. To all ships. To the sea herself. <laughs> we made it free, Steve. The two of us. <coughs> uh, I can't seem to shake this off. Hey, sit yourself down. We can watch the parade from here. <coughs> I'll be fine. I won't be beaten by a cold. Young and strong, me. Harry was right. He made a full recovery. But it wasn't a cold. It was called Spanish flu. Not that it came from Spain. It killed more people than all the battles in the whole of the Great War. Across the globe, between 50 and 100 million were felled by it. Not my Harry, though. He was strong. Good lungs. All that singing. 
Perhaps I should have spent more time singing. Blow the wind, sorry, sorry, sorry. Blow the wind, south. Mother, Harry, I'm right here. Don't let him push you aside. Shh, calm now. Don't let him hit you. Harry, you I need right here. I'm right here. Shh. By the time of his death on Valentine's Day, 1919, at the age of 37, Stephen Reynolds had won the right for fishermen to insure their boats. He'd put the first motor in a fishing boat, the Puffin, which led to the motorisation of the entire fishing fleet. Reynolds managed the South West fisheries before and during the war. Saved hundreds of fishermen from combat through the creation of Section Y of the Naval Reserves. Wrote a novel, published many articles and short stories, and a longshore, his musings on the beach that bridges the land and the sea. Stephen's book, The Navy and the Nation, was read by Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, and may well have played a part in Churchill's naval reforms. And his groundbreaking autobiographic fiction, A Poor Man's House, is still in print. He saw and, and respected how, how we lived. He, he, he lived with us. He, he was our friend. He was family. He was my life. My son. Let sense be dumb, let flesh return. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire. Oh, still small voice of God. Oh, still small voice of God. Fish Out of Water was directed by Pippa Marriott and recorded with a community cast. David Lloyd played Stephen, Felix Jones, Harry Painter, Peter Murphy was Bob Woolley, and Val Marchant, his wife, Ma'am. Deborah Robertson played Stephen's mother, Mike Flynn, his father, and Mark Chapman was the narrator Stephen. Robin Laird played the vicar, Graham Cumming, Hilaire Belloc, and Emma Gray joined our chorus along with singers from the Sidmouth Seafest Choir, the children were played by Sidmouth Church of England primary school students Greta, Ruby and Molly. Fish Out of Water was recorded at Sound Gallery Studios in Exeter and on location in Sidmouth and produced by Ear, Nose and Throat. Our thanks to the Sidvale Association for funding support and Sidmouth Coastal Community Hub CIC for making this possible. The house that Stephen Reynolds owned is now the Sidmouth Museum an ideal place to visit to find out more, or read Nigel Hyman's excellent biography of Stephen Reynolds, which so informed this production. Fish Out of Water was first performed at Sidmouth Seafest in 2019 and is a Sidmouth Coastal Community Hub project. <laughs>